Well, I think it's important, firstly, for people to actually understand what anxiety is, because oftentimes I think anxiety can make people feel so out of control within their body that they actually, they don't know um, what they're actually going through, what their body's going through. They feel completely out of control and helpless almost. And I think that is often more or sort of adding to, to the stress and the anxiety. So there is, um, there is something that you get called acute stress, which is in the short term, it is um, you have a proposal due for work or you have an assignment for school and it's you have a deadline and you get it done and you hand it in and the anxiety and the stress comes down um, that is acute and that's in the short term but then you have long term and extended anxiety where and that actually has um, a more detrimental effect on you physically and psychologically than the acute anxiety the acute anxiety is normal and it's everyday things where if it's ongoing and chronic that's really damaging because what actually happens without becoming too scientific and yeah but your body goes into something called um or the sympathetic nervous system gets activated now you don't need to remember that word but basically it just means that there's a system in your body that gets activated where for, and everything in your body changes when that happens for example you, um, your body doesn't really focus on digesting food or your pupils um, actually change, and they, they dilate and things like that. So your, your heartbeats become quicker. Um, everything like that mm. physically changes when, you're imp when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. And all these adrenaline, cortisol, all of these hormones, stress hormones, get released into your body. And in the short term, um, your, sort of your body starts to actually, your brain adapts to scan the environment for danger. And the more that they, they've done a lot of studies on it, where they've seen that the more your body is actually, if you, for example, have childhood PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, late in your life, they did studies to show late in your life, you actually have more of these stress hormones constantly circulating in your body, which you can imagine someone that had childhood PTSD with someone that didn't, their body chemistry is okay. so different. So for, for someone that already had PTSD when they were younger, uh, something, let's say, stressful happens at work, and immediately those hormones skyrocket and they're triggered. What is meant to happen naturally is we're meant to the parasympathetic nervous system is meant to be activated, which just means those hormones come down again, the hormones leave your body. Um, and that is where we actually have an influence over that. And we do that by, for example, meditation. Um, and when I say meditation, I don't necessarily mean sitting with your eyes closed in silence for an hour. I mean, any type of focused attention, whether that is you driving your car and you're actually spending time observing the world around you, you're looking at the color of the trees, you're looking at the shape of the leaf, wherever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. that for me is also right. that mindfulness. Um, yes. So all of, yeah. and, and exercise, for example, all of these activities that actually bring down those stress hormones. Um, and when I think for people to have an understanding of, as I say, what physically happens in their body when they're under stress, mm -hmm. just as important as then knowing how to deal with it. And that is where all these other, having a good social support network, um, having like a support structure around you, whether that includes therapy or um, right. Right. and I, 
I also think boundaries come come in, into play there, where you need to have boundaries in terms of knowing, um, let's say, for example, having your downtime, scheduling, as you say, like time with your daughters, where that is your time or your family time. Mm-hmm. Sorry. That it's not it's not mm-hmm. this constant stress that your body is under, oh. um, and those little minor mm-hmm. things actually make quite a big difference. So that's the basic. When it comes to no, 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 it's a, be, beautiful. I, I, I love listening to you. You make it make it uh, very, very uh, easy to listen to you and understand what you're saying. But I do have to ask this. Um, so if a person is not taking time uh, to, to meditate or be reflective uh, on their life and focus on uh, their life and everything is just in a repetitive mode, then anxiety has, I'm just asking, anxiety kind of has a chance to breed uh, or to multiply because there's, there seems, it, it almost sounds like what you're saying, there is no really getting off the train and, and, and you're just constantly, the locomotive, it just keeps going mm-hmm. and it kind of, things can't make any sense then people find themselves not being able to make sense of their life. Well, the difficult thing is also when your body is under that constant stress. And as you say, you're not getting off of the train, your sleep, everything starts to be impacted because, for example, when mm-hmm. we are, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated and our body is sort of fl- rushing with all these stress hormones, mm-hmm. you don't care about eating. Mm-hmm. Your body's not focused on digesting food, for example. Your body is definitely okay. not focused on sleeping or having a nap. Mm-hmm. So when you're constantly on that train, things start breaking down because you're not eating probably properly more, more than likely and you're also not sleeping. Um, so it's mm-hmm. quite a difficult, yeah, you need that balance. You need for your body to have these moments, these breaks for it actually to come down mm-hmm. for you to, to rest and for your body to recuperate. Um, and when right, you're right. not getting off of that train, your body can't do that. So everything starts to deteriorate because when we're not sleeping properly and we're not eating properly, our mind is not working to its optimal capacity. So everything sort of yeah, goes backwards. It's quite dangerous. And so, so if you're dealing with a client and you're trying to give them some perspective on uh, certain parameters, uh, different things that they can do, that they can apply in their life to create this uh, this uh, uh, this manageable stress, uh, <laughs> the man- manageable stress-filled life, <laughs> because uh, there is a measure of stress we're going to have that is beneficial to us. Uh, but but a person that's feeling overwhelmed, mm-hmm. overtaxed, and, and without a doubt, they're they're feeling like they just are overworked, as it were, uh, emotionally, what steps and suggestions would you hand out to them that they could maybe apply to start making um, making progress? If you had to say step one, two, and three there that you could throw out there, I'm quite sure there's more to it than that. Mm. What would you be able to say? Because I love the fact that you brought in boundaries. Well, firstly, I think identifying the source of the stress. So I de- and oftentimes that's not just one thing, but identifying the various things that really is adding stress to your life. Number two, I would say putting... And, and this is where boundaries come in, deciding, for example, when I was studying, for me a boundary was I'm not working after a certain time at night. I will do, I will work hard and I will get up early and I'll do what I have to do during the day, but I'm not working late at night. That's my time and that's, I'm sleeping and I'm doing my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and having those. That's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of like, I, mean, I just want to make sure I understand what you just said. Number two. So pretty much you, what you're saying is this is your time of night. You shouldn't be talking to me. Well, that was when I was studying. <laughs> look at the look, of, look at the look on your face. I'm just going to I'm sorry, I just had to, I had to, I had to interject and do that. I'm such a <laughs> okay, so go ahead. You're saying you're leading up to number three. Yeah, so just having so, those st- boundaries okay. and being able to, to, to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I 
would really like to do this, but I'm yeah. unfortunately unable to do that right, right. now. It's not going right. to be the best thing yeah. for me. Basically right. saying no, I guess that can be number three. No. Saying yeah. no sometimes. Yeah. And it doesn't, uh -huh. I think people feel guilt, extreme guilt when they have to say no, especially parents. Um, mom guilt is thing. Really? Um, when you have, yeah. Oh, the mom guilt. Yeah. 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 When you have to yeah. say yeah. No, unfortunately, I can't do this. Um, but it is important because it's that typical thing of if you can't give from an empty cup, you need to fill your own cup in order to be able to give to others. You need to actually invest time into yourself in order to, to be able to give and to be present. Um, so having those boundaries and, and that time for yourself can mean for some people – taking half an hour a day to exercise because for them that's yeah. a stress yeah. relief that's important um maybe listening to music whatever it is um communicating that to the people in your life so that they can understand why this is important for you the needs that you have um so i, I think like setting up that clearly like communicating clearly about your needs um, but then sticking to it and saying no, having those boundaries sometimes mm. is really important. Right, right. Um, and then I would say, and, mm -hmm. and, no, no, I would no, say incorporating, no. I guess, a mindfulness element that works for you. There, there are a lot of, um, like, if you Google, um, sort of anxiety reducing or. Um, techniques a lot of things come up for example there's one that I really like it's called progressive muscle relaxation technique or exercise wait, wait. Progressive, progressive muscle, muscle relaxation relaxation progressive muscle relaxation mm -hmm. okay so basically what that just is is when you're lying in bed at night to actually start scanning your body and every like as you're moving through your muscles to consciously relax them and actually like mm -hmm. and i've done this where i am rushing and i'm getting into bed and i'm okay sleep and then i can't sleep because obviously my body's like rushing with adrenaline and it's it's busy yeah. Yeah. and then i actually scan my body and as i'm doing it i'm realizing my shoulders are actually hunched my shoulders are still yeah. up yeah and then to actually scan your body and say, no, you can actually relax these now. It, it helps quite a lot. And you go from top to bottom, scanning your entire body. And as you're moving through the different mm -hmm. muscle groups, actually putting them down and relaxing them. So, for example, that's one technique um, that you can do every night. And it doesn't have to take a long time. But every night when you just get into bed, just scan your body and make sure that your muscles are actually relaxed. But there's a lot of techniques like that out there. There's one where you, I'm not sure the order, I always make it up as I go along, but basically it's like seeing three things, identifying three things in the room. Then um, becoming aware of smelling two things or hearing two things or whatever it is, and then maybe tasting one thing. So it just takes your, and this helps quite a lot with people having a panic attack because it actually takes the okay. awareness away from, I can't breathe, I, I, to actually sort of takes it to um, sort of absorbing what's going on around you, becoming aware of the space around mm -hmm. you and absorbing the information okay. so that you're not so focused on what's physically happening to you. But there are a lot of techniques, and I would tell people, Find one or two that works for you. Not the, the same thing as I said earlier, maybe closing your eyes and meditating is not for you maybe. It maybe works wonders for the person next to you, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something that you can find that actually really works for you. So I would encourage people to try that as well. When, when, you're, when you're working with someone and uh, they, uh, they are a little resistant mm -hmm to uh, applying some of the uh, the things that you're recommending and uh, suggesting for them so that they can find their own emotional maturity and, and, and safe place and just clear up their mind maybe from, from, uh, from the past. Mm -hmm. 
how, how do you navigate that when someone uh, is not necessarily cooperative as a therapist? How does it, how do you as a therapist handle that when someone uh, is resistant? I actually enjoy my resistant clients. Um, I think. <laughs> uh, I am not surprised you said that. I was trying to hold this very, very, but I can't. I am not surprised that you would say that. I had a feeling you would say that, but I would, if you went the other way, I said, I got to go with it. I go with it, but I'm not surprised. So it had to come out. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, girl. Go ahead and say your thing. Go ahead. No, what? Go ahead. I find my. Re- I want to hear. I want to hear now. I Miss, find my. Miss, re- Miss, re- Miss, re- Miss want to hear only set only want to listen to sad songs <laughs> Miss confrontational but in the th- in the therapist room you're confrontational go ahead go ahead I want to hear your explanation on you you ready to go when the okay no well point. I enjoy the um I guess the mental stimulation and challenge that comes with a client <laughs> in the you didn't just say that you seriously as a therapist didn't just say that. And by the way, so if anybody sees this uh, later or is listening now, please, please uh, see uh, uh, Leisha. Am I saying it right? Did I say Hold it? on. Okay. I've been practicing. See, please see Leisha. If you need a little, you know, a little bout, if you want to go toe-to-toe, round for round uh, with her, she loves it. So don't waste your time with those nice uh, pansy uh, therapists. <laughs> you, you, want, you, want, you want to get into the ring with, <laughs> with Leisha. She'll, she'll let's have at it. Go ahead. So you kind of like the the mental uh, challenge and stimulation with a the therapist that's resistant a little bit, or that doesn't see the work that. Go ahead. Well, I, shady, shady. I think with Go clients ahead. that for for me, obviously initially I'll want to hear their fears and I'll want to hear what they're resistant. Of course, about. yes, of um, course. Right. And then I would also like just as much as I expect them to have boundaries or I would encourage them and work facilitate having yes. boundaries, yes. I also need mm-hmm. to have boundaries. So for example, um yeah, I, let's say if I um say I don't know, let's say a client's asking me personal questions and I don't think it's relevant for the process, then you can right. you know okay. what I do. I right. think right. that this is relevant and I, I would like to get back to you or whatever it is. So I right. have those boundaries in, in myself as well. Um, but the, yeah, with the resistant clients or with clients that don't maybe want to try these different anxiety reducing techniques i can understand that i can understand that it's actually quite daunting and intimidating to because okay. also one thing we can't underestimate is i'm asking someone to become mindful and aware of their body which is sometimes something that people fight not to be they don't want to be present one no, I can see that. Yeah, except right. present. So for me, asking someone to actually be present with themselves is sometimes really scary and threatening, and and I and I understand that. But and that's why I'd want to know where their resistance is coming from, what they're uncomfortable with, and then guiding them through that in a way that. I mean, they obviously came to therapy for help. They're obviously there for a reason, and they want me to change. Right. right. So right. I will encourage them, or hopefully I will build a safe enough therapeutic relationship that they can understand this is safe, this is okay. And I will tell them, try it. If it doesn't work for you, stop immediately. You don't have to keep doing it but try and see where you become uncomfortable. And then we work with whatever comes up. We work with that discomfort or we work with the fear or the anxiety or whatever was induced by whatever exercise. Um, so I would encourage them to give it a chance. I would hear them out. I would hear them and listen to what they're uncomfortable with and then explore that with them, bring it into the room and explore that discomfort. So I'm definitely, I don't shy away from it. I tell my clients, if you're angry at me, if you're hmm. frustrated with something I'm saying, tell me. That- you ever had that? Was it you ever had that where they were angry at yeah. you? Yeah. I've, I've had clients tell me, mm-hmm. I don't like what you're saying. I, you're annoying me, but okay. I know you're right. <laughs> but it's, I'm like, does that, wait. So if they tell you that, does that mean that they're making progress with their inner child? That they're telling you that they don't want Well, it means that they're 
Yeah. It means they're being honest. It means yeah. the therapeutic they're being honest. Yes. Right. That they feel safe yeah. enough to be honest with me and they know. Because yeah. yeah. actually what I'm doing by doing that is creating a space where I'm holding them. And if they want to come and they right. say, right. I'm angry right. at you and I'm so annoyed, then that's okay. This is still yeah. a safe space for you regardless. So that's, it's basically... Yeah, showing what I'm actually teaching them um, in real life, right. putting it into practice. So, so, so this, this, so you're like, it's, it's like emotional triage that you do. It's kind of like this emotional triage type of. You're kind of like working in this emergency type yeah. situation with these people, and so, so it's very important then uh, for you not to take things personal. Then yes, completely, and and that's why I um. I think that it's quite valuable for people in our industry to actually have be seeing their own psychologist or counselor or whoever mental health professional because it's so important for for me to be aware of my own things, my own triggers, my own challenges, my own insecurities because we all have them and I need to be aware of where mine are so that when it comes into the room, if it does, that I can identify that and I can manage that as opposed to the client ever having to be subjected to that or them having to try and um, you know, navigate their way through my right, emotions. Right. I need to keep that separate from the client and I need to contain that myself. Right. right. So now you get to be tortured by me because we, we've had some, some serious discussions about some serious aspects of living understanding that you know we have to take one day at a time and we need to be reasonable with our stress we need to make sure that we try to be as orderly as possible in our life so that anxiety doesn't take over and that there are things that you've mentioned that people can see but now <laughs> no i'm just kidding so now i get to ask you this is this will be easy this is on my narc abuse tv channel i do this game called pick a pose okay. in which i take I am banking that you're not able to see your page and everybody that will see this or that is watching it now, they can go to your page and your page is what again? Can you tell everybody again? Therapy underscore with underscore Lisha. L-E-I-S-H-A. Yes, yes, absolutely. That is your page. And I am there now and I get to ask you whatever I'm looking at that you can't see and you have to explain it or tell me what what you were thinking when you posted that. <laughs> so, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Lisha, let's see here. Which will I pick? Oh, let's go with this one. Okay, I get to read this to you. Then you can tell me what you were thinking about this post and why you posted it. Okay. So, the post was is dated October 1st. And it says... When I am sharply judgmental of any other person, it's because I sensed or see reflected in them some aspect of myself that I don't want to acknowledge. Now, you posted that on October 1st, and then you had in your comments a, a beautiful statement. But I'm going to read a little bit of it, and then you can tell us what you were thinking. You put in here, stigma allows us to separate ourselves from the other. It allows us to turn away and pretend like that could never be our reality. However, rooted within that judgment is the realization that that could be you, me, your mother, your brother, your friend. On October 1st, you posted that. What were you thinking when you posted that? <laughs> <laughs> it actually comes from um, Gabor Mate. Um, he is, um, I believe he's a psychiatrist um, and he works a lot in the field of addiction. And I obviously I'm also in the field of addiction to yes. some extent. Yes. Um, yes. And that is, that is another show that we will be doing together. Well, go ahead. And he was speaking about <laughs> the fact, his own experiences, and he was saying that when he is 
he said sometimes his daughter would come to him and say something and he would be critical of her and frustrated and judgmental. And he said that he realized that when he does that, it's because he's actually feeling guilty and feeling that judgment about himself. And that's why he spells it onto her because of that discomfort that he's actually feeling internally. And so I encourage people to look inward and to look at when we feel the need to so harshly criticize someone else and say that that is them, that is that person, it'll never be us, then I want Mm -hmm. us to look at that. and and, And I think that people shy away from the realization that that could be us. I mean, the person on the side of the street injecting themselves with whatever, that could be us. We have the potential to become that because we all have pain Mm -hmm. and we all grab different Mm -hmm. things to to manage and soothe that pain. And I think Mm -hmm. that stigma comes from not wanting to acknowledge that reality. And when we can actually look at that and we can say that I have the ability to become that, then that yeah. stigma falls away and we can look at it more clearly. Someone once told me, um, it was a colleague of mine, and he said that he was trying to make a statement and he said, you're the worst tree clown I've ever met. And he said, you don't care about that insult I just gave you. That means nothing in the world to you because you don't mm-hmm. measure yourself on your ability to climb trees. So you don't. But if I told you you're good. the worst counsel in the world, that would affect you ah, because you ah, value right, right, yeah. So the, my point with that is when we say something that holds no value or no meaning, you're going to be like, okay, I don't care, and you're going to move on. Whatever, whatever. But when, yeah, when whatever. we are so, when our emotions rise so sharply and passionately and the anger comes up or the discomfort comes up, there's something there and we need to look at that. And so for me, with someone later using substances, if we said that will never be us, that's disgusting, there's strong emotions coming up, then we need to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You you almost made me want to stop the game because that was just like so good. That was good. But I'm not. I refuse to because I've got to do two more and then you can actually go to bed. No, so no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, you can do as you wish. Okay, so are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I've been waiting to, to do this. So you posted. You see that there? You posted that. Yes. Can you see it? I love that. Okay, it says, it says I do too. I do too, and I didn't even post it. So, 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 so it says negative backslash bad emotions. And then the arrow, the arrow, the arrow, I'll do my Vanna White, the, the arrow. Uncomfortable backslash difficult emotion. Now, I scroll there and I go there, and it says, uh, are you ready? Okay. I often encourage my clients to change the way they view emotions. Try changing your language and become conscious conscious of language that disqualifies certain emotions. You write, for example, anger, fear, pain are not inherently bad. Yes, uncomfortable and even difficult, but not bad. They are very necessary. They are a very necessary part of your emotional landscape. What you write in two other paragraphs after that is very delicious and very good. But I'm not going to read them. Whoever's listening or watches this later is going to have to go to your page to see the rest. But what were you thinking on September 15th when you posted that? (laughs) What were you thinking? So I was actually, I'm going to refer to another professional again. I was listening to um, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. He, um, he's a psychologist. He's registered as a psychologist and he has a a few podcasts and he had Mm -hmm. um, 
someone that he interviewed and they spoke about the fact that there are no emotions that are inherently bad all emotions serve a function for example if i if my kid is about to walk into the road and i shout and pull them back <laughs> and i say why did you mm-hmm. like you need to look before you cross the road that mm-hmm. anger allowed me to react quickly and it it is based on fear so those emotions and things all serve a function and and they have a purpose and a survival thing behind them mm-hmm. for example right. if i'm angry right. yes yes it's an uncomfortable emotion and it's often frowned upon but it also allows me to to evaluate what does that person have how did they get where they are what do i maybe need to replicate where do i need to change my game whatever it is so all of these d- difficult mm-hmm. emotions have a function and they serve mm-hmm. a value and when we say bad emotions i think it's extremely unhelpful because it immediately categorizes as this is negative avoid this feeling don't go there but those emotions are actually necessary for your survival they're healthy they're a, a natural part for example if my partner is sending a message to someone else um another woman mm-hmm. and i get angry that is me asserting a boundary mm-hmm. and that's going to make that not yeah. happen again or make me right. say you know what i'm out of this relationship so that anger that i felt allowed me to assert that boundary and allowed me to to move on to better things um so those emotions are necessary and i don't think that we should label it as good or bad uncomfortable yes or comfortable that's fine but not bad because bad implies that it needs to be avoided and it needs to when you feel it you should feel anxious about feeling it and you should feel shameful about feeling it and i don't think that's helpful at all rather we should say i can understand that this is uncomfortable for you to feel this um but not bad mm-hmm. because that's just labeling things um and disqualifying certain emotions where i think again we need to be able to okay. hold it we need to be able to hold the comfortable and the the you know uncomfortable all in one you you are you are indeed a very authentic person <laughs> uh without a doubt uh and uh as you authentically navigate your life um i i hope that uh we get a chance to go through some other things in our pre-show prep i told you addiction of course and some other things that i have in mind that we'll be get a chance to do some more uh whoever uh, has you as a therapist is uh truly in a privileged spot because uh you're you're truly one of a kind So don't even try to think that I'm coming to an end here cuz I'm not cuz I got to ask one more thing. I got to ask one more thing that I've been waiting to ask you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Silence hurts more than truth. Mm. Now this was posted uh what 9 hours ago? Yeah, it's and you were this day here in yeah. South Africa but Yes, yes. This Yes, it is uh the 10th, the October 10th, yesterday. Uh was a uh, right mental health awareness day for you as well there as well here in the states. You put you wrote this. This is what you wrote. I hope that you decide to speak up. To use you to use the voice you have to create a space where you don't have to hide in the shadow. I hope you realize that you deserve to be seen, heard, understood. Your mental health does not define you. But we so easily devote our entire lives to concealing it. This silence often hurts more than the truth. In such a beautiful ele- elegant way you wrote this. I see you and I'm not looking away. Why did you post that? Where were you emotionally and mentally when you posted that? Well, I think considering I mean, yeah, the fact that it's mental health awareness and I was reading some things that people were posting on it and obviously I think more more and more 
thankfully, um, people are becoming mm-hmm. more comfortable with speaking out about their mental health or mental illness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that it's important yeah. for people to to understand that that is seen, that is heard, and that is accepted. Right. That it's not people, myself included, are not going to reject that or look away or, yeah, reject you in any mm. way for that. That's a part yeah. of who you are and you're allowed to be authentic in that and you will be accepted regardless um, with all of that because that's true and that's that's what we all go through. So I think I just wanted to to allow whoever reads that to to hear that that's okay and they are a lot of people when you show these different sides of yourself there are people that won't look away there are people that will stay and will that have probably felt the same as well so i just wanted people to hear that Uh, kudos to you for posting it and for having a beautiful page a very well balanced authentic page um (laughs) But I, I know it it all comes from you're watching Shutter Island over and over again. Uh, so, so, so. It's good. It's not happening. It's good. It's good. So, 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 so I see, I see right now, you're going to have to, you're going to have to post on your page some type of um, uh, Shutter Island Zoom type of thing you do with all your friends. So that everybody, everybody's going to go like, but that's a cool therapist. I think I want to call her up. So, it's kind of, so anyhow, I don't mind. Don't, don't listen to me. I'm, I'm losing my mind. Uh, uh, beautiful Sunday morning for me. Uh, a, a, a day coming to an end for you in South Africa. Uh, because you've given up some of your time uh, to spend uh, talking to us about uh, inner child work and anxiety. And um, um, uh, when you were uh, a very young uh, young lady, a, a young child, uh, and you saw some young boy that you liked and, and had a crush on him. Uh, so we, we, we've discussed a lot of things uh, that you had no idea uh, probably that we were going to talk about, but you have made this an absolutely great uh, uh, interview and discussion and conversation, and uh, I am I am not uh, going to uh, forget it because uh, I can get to watch it over and over again. Uh, so so so. Uh, 